you, are both what you do and what happens to you. So that you have a little game in which you play that what happens to you, that you're not responsible for. That's not you, see? You're only responsible for this side of it. And then you can compete with the other side. What it's like is this. Get two knitting pins, one in each hand, and have a fencing match with yourself. And really sincerely try to stick the other hand. But that other hand must really sincerely be trying to stick the first one and also to defend itself. It's like playing chess with yourself. See? Now it won't work. You'll come to a sort of standstill unless you decide for your right hand that that's the one that's really going to win. Well, then you've broken the rule of the game, you see. Well, that's what we do. That's what the, is called by both the Hindus and the Buddhists, avidya, ignorance, which really better means ignorance. So what it comes down to, you see, is basically this. Just in the same way that the authority of the guru is your authority. You did. So the place where you are in life is where you've put yourself. And just as on the surface of a sphere, every point may be regarded as the center of the surface, so every place may be regarded as the true place and everyone's in his true place. Everybody, in other words, put it in what language you will, is a manifestation of the divine. Playing this game, that game, the other game. And you're not knowing it, if you don't know it, is part of the game. Makes it all the more fun. Get lost, you say to yourself, and lost you get. Like children love to play hide and seek, to get lost. Like we all like to go to a play, see a horror movie, and have the cold shivers because we think the awful awfuls are going to happen. Something is going to be seen on the screen which we can't stand to see. Ooh, won't that be a thrill if it happens? <laughs> we all expose ourselves to that, just as children and young people are always exposing themselves to dreadful things. And the parents get absolutely, they get the heebie-jeebies. They think if it isn't getting drunk or driving hot rods, they take drugs. And that may ruin their sanity for life. How horrible can it be? And if they don't take drugs, they'll uh, do something else. Always to see how close to the point of danger you can get. And most people who go in for racing cars usually end up in a crash. And they know it. But the life is all the sweeter for being played dangerously. So I would say to those among you who are the most deadheads, in the sense of unspiritual and square, if there are any here, are real stuffy people. Congratulations. <laughs> you see? You're playing a very far out game. <laughs> see, you're so lost, you don't even know where you stood. <laughs> That's taking a gorgeous risk. Why? Because of you, we might even blow up the planet. <laughs> How close are we going to get to that one? Well, just in the same way as that car racer watches the needle going up, 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 there are these people feeling more and more and more righteous, determined that good shall prevail, watching that needle go up, it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter, 
And finally, they go out in a blaze of glory. <laughs> and then when the dust settles, they say, Whew. that was a close squeak. I mean, that was quite a dream we've woken up from. See, where will we go next? See, here's, that's the point, it's simple. That's why I would say that my function is liberative. I want you to see that it's you. It's not me. It's not Swami so-and-so. It's not Buddha so-and-so. It's not Saint so-and-so. It's you. You do it. As Sir Edwin Arnold put the words into the mouth of the Buddha, you suffer from yourselves. None else compels. None other holds you that you live and die and whir upon the wheel and hug and kiss its spokes of agony, its tire of tears, its nape of nothingness. And when one of the old Zen masters went to his teacher and said, what is the way to liberation? The teacher said, who is restraining you? He said, no one. If so, why should you ask for liberation? It all bounces back to you. What do you want? Do you know what you want? Can you think it through? Say exactly what you want. And invariably, you'll get back to the place where you are. Because what you say you want is always the symptom, the expression of what you are now. If then that is the case, that it's all there because you're doing it. Why meditate? Why do anything of a so-called spiritual nature? People don't understand really what meditation is. They take it up like they take up psychotherapy or a course in weight reduction in order to be better. But if you do that, you are not practicing what is called jhana or yoga or zen. That's not it at all. Meditation is the one human activity which has no purpose. Buddhas, who are supposed to have attained everything, are invariably shown in some sort of meditation posture. Why should they meditate anymore? Because that just happens to be the way that a Buddha sits when he sits. When he sits, he sits. When he walks, he walks. He's not going anywhere. He's just going for a walk. Because he digs it. See, to dig, the word, very word means not merely to appreciate, but to penetrate. To go to the heart of the matter and to penetrate the moment. To get right to the root of the moment is nowhere else than the center of you, where you are. It's where you start this whole thing. So get, I mean, to get with yourself is to get at the moment where you begin all this questioning. Where does the question come from? Where does the desire spring from? Well, that's you, and that you is the point from which the whole universe is created. Flowing back into the past like the wake of a ship. <coughs> wake doesn't drive the ship, it's the ship that makes the wake. So here you are, producing it. A meditation is just sitting and watching it happen. And it's not done because it's good for you. It's done for fun. I might even say meditation is a fun thing. And if it isn't, you're not meditating. There's an awful game that meditators play, which is competitive suffering. <laughs> you know, they go to some place 
where they sit for hours on end until their legs ache and practically fall off. <laughs> and then come back and brag about they sat through all those hours of leg aching. Now, it's very difficult to put down people who are suffering. <laughs> because, after all, one has a natural sympathy for pain. But I sometimes want to say, for goodness sake, don't throw your suffering at me in that way and in that spirit. Don't brag about it. Don't one-up me by saying, well, I've suffered more than you have. People do things like that. They say, well, I'm more aware of my shortcomings than you are. I'm more tolerant than you are. I am um, recognize more than you do what a rascal I am. There are every kind of way of one-upping somebody else in order to play the game in which I always win. So once we get into that kind of thing with the meditation scene, we get into hierarchies and ranks and degrees and who has attained number seven, who has attained number nine, and the expert guru will always put a stage higher than anyone anybody's thought of. It serves to see how far your ambition will run. And so this goes on endlessly, endlessly, endlessly until you suddenly wake up and begin real meditation by realizing that you were there. That you do really meditate all the time by virtue of existing all the time. Only you miss that eternal now by always looking for something next minute, expecting a result. Now you can't say let me not expect a result. Because one does anyhow. And so you may just as well sit and enjoy it. <laughs>